All right, so now I guess I'm going to sort of talk a bit and do a bit of an introduction. Um, with us, we have the wonderful Brandon Cole and Stacey Jenkins. They are two, I like to say, friends who I have discovered through the accessible gaming world. Um, I'm sure they will do a little bit more of an intro about themselves when they start talking. Um, myself, I have started my gradual kind of introduction to accessible gaming and this part of my activism and advocacy. Um, and I've started streaming and all sorts and Stacey helped me get all set up with that. Um, so that's exciting and I have given a couple of talks about it and I have learned a lot from these two and it's it, for me as an activism area obviously all activism is important as we always say but it's a really exciting area of activism and it's and I'm sure as both Stacey and Brendan will say it's been a busy week for game accessibility it's been a lot going on uh, we are in the week before kind of the big sort of Thanksgiving, pre-Christmas, lots of games being launched, lots of new consoles being launched. And so there's been a lot to talk about. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting area because, you know, getting games right means a lot to a lot of people. And I know Brandon's gonna talk a little bit more about uh, The Last of Us 2, which he did a lot of work and consulting on. Um, and when, you know, when I talk to people and they say, oh, it's just video games, though, that's not really important, you know, actually what's more important is, uh, you know, street infrastructure or whatever. Of course, that stuff is really important, but gaming is like a billion dollar industry. And when you have a massive, what we call AAA game, you know, blockbuster, if we're using Hollywood language, game, that is making such a big commitment to accessibility. And even though this week the debate has been very heated and not very pleasant, it's really becoming a thing that even kind of other gamers are aware of now. And in my opinion, it's a fantastic way to start lots of conversations around digital accessibility. Um, and, you know, we can talk about even more accessibility. And I think, it, it, I really think it opens up a lot of interesting stuff to talk about and I'm going to shut up now because I've been waffling a bit. Um, I am going to hand over to Stacey first, if that's okay, um, who is going to introduce herself, talk a little bit about what she does, you know, uh, what, what Stacey enjoys in life, what you get up to. I'm just taking my cardigan off, like I'm getting really ready. I'm so ready for this gaming chat. I'm taking my cardigan off. Um, so yeah, Stacey's going to chat to us for a little bit. Um, about 10, 15 minutes, whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, and then I'll be handing over to Brandon, play a couple of little videos again, chat for about 10, 15 minutes. And then we will open up the floor or the screen. <laughs> okay, all righty. Um, Stacey, are you ready? You ready? You good to go? Hello. Yeah? Good. I'm ready. All right, go for it. It's my first staying in, so thank you for having me. Um, my name is Stacey. Um, I'm known online as Stacey of Gotham. So I'm a big Batman fan, and I made my username a very long time ago. Um, I'm a disabled content creator. Um, I've been streaming on Twitch for about six or seven years now. Um, I'm also the owner of the Chronically Badass community on Twitch and Discord, which is for um, other gamers, streamers, viewers, etc. Uh, with uh, chronic illnesses and um, disabilities, which Lovely Amy is part of now. Um, I haven't been disabled all of my life. Um, I was diagnosed with uh, POTS or Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. Um, and later on in life uh, with fibromyalgia. So I have a lot of pain. Um, and as I'm sure some of you guys know, the pain gives me a lot of brain fog. Um, so I have lots of, uh, lots of sort of cognitive issues uh, that I never had before. So that started making things 
a lot more difficult and gaming was one of the things that I started finding more difficult. Um, so I actually started streaming on Twitch because it was a way to just, it gave me something to wake up in the morning for. I wasn't able to work. I wasn't really able to sit up in a chair for more than about an hour at a time. Um, and Twitch was just my kind of my window into the other world. <laughs> um, so that's kind of how I started talking about accessibility and getting into advocacy. Um, so here I am several years later, um, basically full, full time in a, in a normal job. And then when I've got time, I like to make content around cognitive accessibility because that's kind of the area that affects me the most. And I think it's important to, um, to talk about the things that are personal to us. And I think it can sometimes be an area of accessibility that can be a little bit overlooked. Um, I think it's probably not, not the first thing that comes to mind when you ask someone, uh, you know, what do they think when they think about accessibility in gaming. Um, so cognitive accessibility in games is anything to do with the brain. So that's things like memory, concentration, processing, information, motion sickness, migraines, seizure triggers, basically it's just a big umbrella for all the other stuff <laughs> that isn't already covered in, um, in the other areas. Um, and something that I hear a lot in response to my videos is I didn't know that I needed this. I have trouble finishing games or I have trouble playing certain games, certain genres of games, and I didn't really understand why, but now I understand why and I never knew that I needed these options. And I think it's something that it's only it's only really now starting to be talked about. And I think there's still quite a lot of stigma attached to it, which is why people don't particularly like talking about it openly, because I think people feel a lot of shame for having cognitive difficulties. Um, and, and, you know, having a, an invisible illness has this whole stigma attached to it, too. So people can often feel embarrassed or feel stupid for having you know, these barriers with games. No one likes to, you know, talk about, well, I couldn't finish this game because it was too hard and I couldn't do this and I couldn't do that. Um, I think it's it's sometimes often um, amplified by the very toxic side of gaming. I know that we will probably talk about it later, but there's a lot of a lot of hate and a lot of just not niceness in, in gaming sometimes. Um, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh interrupt Stacey, just going to have a change over in interpreters. Ooh, okay. Ready? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there are, there are a big cohort of, uh, of, you know, gamer dudes who think that easy mode is cheating, you know, games are for serious, serious gamers only, but gaming is for everyone and we should be making games with a wide selection of options so that everybody can play. And I think especially in the age of COVID, a lot of us are more isolated than we were before. And gaming can not only be entertainment, something to pass the time, something to get excited about, it can be incredibly social. And I think um, that's something that, you know, a lot of people are starting to play games now, you know, in lockdown and everything. Um, and for me, Twitch and gaming was my social life. I couldn't leave the house really for, days at a time. Um, so it was my creative outlet, it was my social life. Um, so yeah, it's something that is really important to me and I, I rant about constantly to my husband. <laughs> um, so the things that we talk about when we're thinking about um, cognitive accessibility in games. So uh, some of you may um, see yourself in some of this. Um, do let us know in chat if any of these ring true with you. So the first one is, how easy is it to learn the game? Do we get a good tutorial? Do we get to practice what we've learned? You know, are we taught the controls at a good pace? Um, how complex is the control scheme? Is it really freaking complicated? Do I have to memorize a whole bunch of different things? Are there multiple, multiple difficulty options? And remember, difficulty is subjective. So what might be easy for one person might be incredibly challenging for another person. Um, so having having difficulty options is always amazing, um, not just for cognitive accessibility, but for for everybody. Um, yeah. <laughs> and 
there are a few games that have come out recently that have um, different difficulty levels for different mechanics. So um, Tomb Raider, it, the recent Tomb Raider trilogy that came out is one of them. Um, you can change, uh, for example, if you're, you really hate the puzzles like me and they stress you out, um, you can put the puzzles down to the easiest difficulty but if you really, really like the combat and you're really good at it, you can turn that up. So having those sort of, those gra more granular uh, difficulty mechanics are, are really cool. And then if we think about memory, which I struggle with a lot when I'm playing games, and I think we'll get onto this when we talk about Assassin's Creed Valhalla, um, what if I forget something? Is there somewhere I can catch up on the story so far? Um, maybe I've forgotten what I'm meant to be doing, I'm on a quest, but I can't remember what I'm looking for. Um, is there a quest tracker in the menu to remind me? And can I find stuff? You know, can I get myself from A to B to find what I'm looking for? And if I'm lost, is there a way of getting back on track? Is there a button that I can push that tells me where I'm meant to be going? Um, maybe you have autism and you find yourself getting really overwhelmed with lots of different things on screen. So um, am I able to turn some of those off maybe? Maybe there are different flashing effects in the game um, and that can be a migraine or a seizure trigger for people. Um, it's actually a game that I really, really enjoyed recently called Spirit Spiritfarer. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have seen it, but it's a very, it's a very chill game, but it's a game about death, um, but it's really lovely. And unfortunately there's, uh, a bit in it where you have to collect lightning in a bottle and there is absolutely no way to skip those sections or turn the lightning effects off so me and my group of friends were all talking about how we've been playing this amazing game and one of our group unfortunately has epilepsy and wasn't able to play it so that that really sucked because it means that you know she was excluded and she wasn't able to be part of that conversation so that's something to think about as well um one that affects me a lot is motion sickness. Um, there have been multiple games that I just have not been able to finish. Uh, I can maybe play for about 15, 20 minutes before the, the camera movement and the motion blur and all that kind of stuff um, makes me feel sick. Uh, so the, the most recent Resident Evil game, Resident Evil 7, I couldn't play. Uh, the most recent uh, Doom games, Doom and Doom Eternal, cannot play them. <laughs> um, so that's another one to think about. Uh, you can turn those some of those features off in some games, but um, sometimes you can't. <laughs> um, but yeah, giving players the freedom to turn some of these features on or off is so important because it can just be one thing that helps someone, helps a player go from, I've just wasted 50 quid on this game and I literally cannot play it, to, oh my gosh, I love this game. I've been able to complete it and I know that when The Last of Us 2 came out, there were so many people that, you know, had managed to complete their first game ever because of some of the features that, that were introduced. So that was awesome. And I know that Brandon's gonna have a lot to say about The Last of Us 2. Um, but it's also other people that can benefit from these options. You don't have to necessarily have a disability to use these options. So maybe you've just had a really rough day and you're tired. Um, and that's making you forgetful. So you need a bit of extra help. Maybe, maybe you've got a temporary injury and you know, the pain is just kind of giving you brain frog. Brain frog? Brain fog. I've definitely done that one before. Um, but truly all options are accessibility options and everybody can benefit from making games more accessible. And if you don't wanna use those options, you don't have to. And I think that's, that's something that I feel like I say online over and over again when people get angry about, you know, introducing an easy mode. Bro, don't play it on easy mode. No one's forcing you to play it on easy mode. Just, just, just ignore it. Um, but yeah, I think we're, we're definitely seeing some massive steps in the right direction. Games are probably more accessible than they've ever been. And there are some really, really great examples um, in, in the last, especially in the last sort of two or three years, but there is always room for improvement. I don't think there's been a, you know, perfect game um, and everyone has different, different um, accessibility needs. And I think there's, there's always room to improve. There's always room to include more players. And that's what I try to advocate for and talk about, but Cognitive accessibility covers such a huge area. So I didn't want to go into too much depth today because I could talk about this for half an hour. 
Um, but I do have a Cognitive Accessibility 101 video on my YouTube channel that covers the basics if you want to learn a bit more. Um, and join in the conversation because I'm, I'm really interested to, to hear, you know, things that have helped other people and um, learn about each other's barriers so that we can, you know, we can talk about it online, we can, you know, share that, share that information with um, devs and stuff. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a little bit about me. I'm very sorry, I talk really fast when I'm nervous. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that's that's it. So um, I think Brandon is going to uh, speak to you guys a little bit about his work that he's been doing on The Last of Us 2. Um, and yeah. That was great, Stacey. Thank you so much. I know I made you talk about such a big topic in such a small amount of time. There's some really interesting comments um, in, in, in the chat around boss fights and being able to skip boss fights because they make you anxious or you can't progress in a game. I think that's something we've all um, experienced before. A lot of love for Witcher 3 and story mode, um, which I would 100% agree with. Witcher 3 was pretty much, apart from the Tomb Raider franchise, Witcher 3 got me back into gaming after my youth. Um, yeah, lots of really interesting um, comments people playing on easy, sometimes on normal. Um, it's a lot of me waff waffling on about pinning people. I apologize, that's in the middle of the, um, the chat. But yeah, I think some really important points. Um, people saying, for me, it's about the physicality. I can't button bash. So games like Heavy Rain or Detroit are incredibly difficult. Um, Somebody said recommending Spider-Man, which I would recommend as a very good game for not button mashing. Um, I'm afraid, I'm, I'm, you know, I tried to cover many bases in this and I knew we would have people that would want to chat about more physical kind of mobility challenges around gaming. And really I should have invited Vivek, but I was kind of running out of time and capacity and it would have been a two hour session otherwise. But I know me and Brandon and Stacey will be able to just spam the chat with links to great advocates. And to be honest, if you follow Stacey and Brandon on Twitter, you'll find a lot of other advocates who talk about these issues. Um, and I suppose two organisations that I'll highlight again at the end, I would say Special Effect are really great. They're really great at giving advice about adaptations that you might need. And um, Able Gamers as well, who just got given a million dollars by Twitch live, live stream, which was amazing. Um, yeah, so, okay, Brandon, should we hand over to you? Do we want to start with your PS5 video? Yeah, sure, let's, let's start with the, uh, the PS5 UI accessibility reveal for the totally blind experience, which was, uh, which now has something like 16,000 plus views. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. I'm looking at it here. Okay, so it's Pretty starting good. at 321. I'm yep. going to screen share. We're just going to play this video. This video does have the screen reader on. It will be talking, I imagine, knowing Brandon very fast. Yep. Um, <laughs> but it will give you um, a bit of an indication about what you can have when things work quite well. So I'm going to share that. Got my share there. So hopefully that will give you a bit of a taste of what a console. Um, so, so this is probably a really good time to swap interpreters. Oh, great. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry if the Zoom wasn't capturing the audio. I apologize. I will put a link in the chat to that video. Give me. Yeah, I was, I was going to say if, if you guys want to see that video for yourselves, it is on my YouTube channel available right now. Go ahead, add more views to that total. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. So we've stopped playing that video now, Emily. I'm sorry if you felt you had to leave because of that. Um, so we might skip the Last of Us 2 video. That's fine. That's fine. If it, and we'll just link it in the chat and people can watch it. Yeah. At the same time Because if it's not, if it's not playing ball and it doesn't want to play through my Zoom, it can sod off. Although it's a wonderful <laughs> video. Zoom, um, <laughs> you are rude. Offic officially, Zoom is rude. Officially, Zoom is me. rude. Um, yep. That is one of Brandon's emotes. An emote <laughs> yep. on That's Twitch. Right. 
it's like an emoji and you can create them for yourself. And one of Brandon's is just the word rude and then rude in Braille. <laughs> which yep, I love. That's right. <laughs> I use it quite liberally, you know, and people are always like, where did you get that one? And I'm like, this guy. <laughs> yep, there you go. Okay, one second. Um, so Brandon, do you want to tell us a little bit about you? And I think people will be very keen to uh, hear all about what it is like to consult on a project because that is yeah. a really interesting thing to learn about and kind of what was that experience like what did it what did it involve people yeah. you know because you know testing video games sounds to most people like the best possible job in the world um so yeah let us know what what does it involve i will i will let you know a bunch of stuff so hi everyone uh it's a long introduction i understand but i am brandon cole if, uh, if you don't know who I am, uh, there's a lot of ways you can find out about who I am. You can go to my website, brandoncole.net. You can find me on Twitter at SuperBlindMan, uh, Twitch at SuperBlindMan. I stream as well. Um, YouTube is, again, SuperBlindMan. I'm SuperBlindMan almost everywhere. Um, I also have a podcast. I do a blog. I do a lot of things. Um, the podcast can be found at breakdownwalls.net slash podcast. Uh, it is part of a movement that my fiance and I started. We call it Breakdown Walls. It is a movement to bring together disabled and non-disabled gamers and streamers and basically generally human beings uh, who are willing to lift each other up, uh, be awesome to each other, help each other out, and uh, you know, just just be good people. Break down walls. It's 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 the way to go. And then we named our podcast after it, which now just hit its sixty-sixth episode, all about next gen. So if you're if you're interested in if you like the sound of my voice. You can hear hours and hours of it on breakdownwalls.net slash podcast. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I started gaming very early in life. And when I started gaming, it was because of a practical joke uh, my brother played on me. Uh, basically, what he did was he told me that I was going to play Mario Brothers with him on our Nintendo. Well, um, we sure did. Uh, in fact, somehow, magically, I beat the entire game, except I didn't, because he was uh, actually, he had, he had handed me the unplugged second player controller while he played the, the whole game. So, yeah, I didn't actually contribute anything to that particular playthrough. The point of the, the uh, well, not the point of the joke, but what ended up happening was, even though I was crushed at the time, I was a little six-year-old kid, I was crushed at the time, but... I think that is what sparked the, uh, the fire within to eventually beat a game without his help. And so I started playing games and trying things out and figuring it out. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's sort of coming together. The way, the way I could use sound to, uh, to figure out what's happening in a game, uh, you know, everything just started coming together uh, because of that joke. Um, and I've been gaming ever since. But the question that Amy was asking me was, about uh, working on a video game uh, consulting. So fast forward many, 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 many years. <laughs> many years. Um, in 2014, I went to GDC. I was invited to GDC to speak on a panel about accessibility. I was the blind gamer perspective on the panel. Um, they, the, develop, the, per, the people on the panel, the people that were running the panel were all mobile game developers who had added something to the, their, their games to make them blind accessible. And I was the blind gamer perspective, you know, to work uh, with them on that. So we did that panel and that panel introduced me to Ian Hamilton, who is one of the guys that runs the game accessibility conference every year. One of the, one of the two major people, Ian Hamilton, Tara Volkar, run that conference every single year. It's a tremendous conference and uh, they're tremendous people. And uh, I was introduced to Ian Hamilton there at GDC. He invited me to the first ever Game Accessibility Conference in 2017. Uh, I, and I went there, made my own speech. This time it was all me uh, speaking about game accessibility um, on my own for almost an entire hour. No, I think it was about a half an hour, actually, now that, now that I remember. Right. Um, and uh, during that speech, well, actually, for context, before the speech, Ian made sure that everyone who was going to speak knew who was in the audience. So I knew that Naughty Dog was in the audience. So I very, very carefully worded my speech and said, man, oh man, what I wouldn't give to play a game like The Last of Us. Um, and uh, they heard that. And you can actually hear on the recording, if you listen very carefully, you can hear on the recording of that speech, 
one of the representatives from Naughty Dog said, oh, well, we got to talk to this guy. So that's what happened. Uh, they approached me after my speech was over. We talked for about an hour that night. Um, and then uh, I didn't know anything would come of it then. But next thing you know, they're inviting me down to the studio um, for an entire day to uh, talk to the entire team uh, about accessibility, about what, what it could be, what it could mean, and my ideas for how it would work in a game like The Last of Us. So I, I have that meeting. And, uh, you know, even then, you know, I, I was super nervous going there for the first time, selling myself to the entire team, because I knew that's what I was really doing. I was selling myself to the entire team. Um, so I went down there with that mindset, knowing that what I was trying to do was convince them not only that they should make a game accessible, but tell them how they could and convince them that it was a possibility, conv convince them that it could be a reality if they work together on it. Um, so it was very much a, a selling myself kind of thing. So I did that meeting. And even then, I didn't really know that more was going to happen. Like, I wasn't sure if they'd invite me back for more. Uh, they did. They did multiple times, in fact. Um, so I worked on The Last of Us 2 for three years, starting in 2017, and uh, right up until launch. And the way I see it, I never really stopped working on it <laughs> because during even when I wasn't down at the studio, my brain just keeps working on projects I'm working on. So it, I, I kept thinking about it and I, I sent emails all the time to my contacts there and said, wait a minute, I just came up with this idea. I need to, I need to send an email about it right away. You know, it's, uh, it's pretty great. Um, it, was, it, was, it was a great time. And also even after launch, after launch, the game is out now, has been out for months, but I still occasionally go, you know, this could be improved. <laughs> Let me just float this idea and see what happens. And some, sometimes it's worked. Some, some things have been improved based on those, those emails. So, but the thing, that, um, the thing that I took away from it, the thing that I took away from it is um, I, am, I can honestly say that I am responsible for the fact that blind accessibility features exist in The Last of Us 2. That's, that's something that I can say that, that no one can take that away from me. Like that's something that I've, I've earned, I've earned that because I worked hard to make sure the game is fully accessible to the blind. And, uh, and, you know, I, and we, we thought, we worked very carefully um, to try to include uh, other, ex you know, other disabilities as well. For instance, um, Stacy was talking about cognitive uh, impairments and one of the things we did, uh, remembering things has, you know, can, can be a problem sometimes. So what we did was, uh, not only do we have a bunch of audio cues for blind users to play the game, we also have an audio glossary, which you can access at any point uh, from the pause menu. So you don't have to remember any of the audio cues if you don't want to. If you hear an audio cue that you don't remember, press pause, go down to the audio glossary, and uh, look for that audio cue, and you'll, you'll hear what it is and what it means and what it's for. And, how to use it. So there you go. Um, but basically, the, the final turnout for accessibility features in The Last of Us Part Two is 60 plus accessibility features across all types of disabilities. 60 plus accessibility features. There is not a single game to date that has met that uh, requirement. Well, not, not requirement, but met that, uh, that level of accessibility features since the last of us part two. Um, we're getting closer. Uh, Spider-Man Miles Morales actually just shocked the world by releasing a pretty decent amount of accessibility features. Um, but it, it's, it's still not quite there yet. But it makes me happy to have been a part of that. Um, as for what the job was like, it, uh, it actually wasn't what you might consider a typical game testing job. So. I saw someone in the chat say game testing is actually one of the most one of the worst jobs of all time, and that's technically true. If that's if that's what you're doing, if you're just a game tester, that is technically true, um, because game testers that are just working as game testers, their daily assignment might be, hey, uh, we think there might be a glitch on this wall in this one area of the game. So here's what we need you to do: we need you to go up to the wall, and we need you to jump at the wall at every point along this wall that exists, every single point, just keep doing it. Uh, that's your assignment. That's all you get to do today. So <laughs> it's not like I get to play games early and it's, it's just the greatest thing in the world. No, 
that's not that's not really the way uh, game testing works. But that's not the way my job worked either. So when I uh, when I worked at the studio, the way it worked is a lot of the time I spent there would be would be spent talking to people, not necessarily even playing the game, just talking to people about what you know where we were, what we had in the game so far. Um, ideas for certain things that they would come up with, like there's going to be a, a mechanic that makes you do this. How should we approach that? You know, so I had to think outside the box and think of solutions to these problems. And then uh, I, I would spend some time testing, but it wouldn't be the the strict rigorous uh, life of a game tester. It would more just be testing the accessibility features, making sure that these things worked the way they're supposed to work, um, and making sure they're they're really helping me as a gamer. Uh, you know, you know, play this game. Um, and I wasn't the only consultant either. Um, I had there was, there was a whole team of consultants. I was, I was very specifically the consultant for blind accessibility. I was brought in to make sure that game could be played by the blind. I want to make that perfectly clear because there's a lot of really good people that worked on The Last of Us Part Two. Uh, Steve Saylor worked on low vision accessibility. James Rath worked on low vision accessibility. Paul Lane worked on uh, motor impairment accessibility. Morgan Baker worked on uh, hearing impairment accessibility. You know, it's it was a team of about eight of us in total, I believe. Uh, Ian Hamilton was consulted with uh, himself. And I mentioned him earlier. He's the, the accessibility guru that invited me to, to Game Accessibility Conference. Um, so, you know, it, it was a whole team of people. Naughty Dog did it right. I got to say, they really did it right. They, they consulted with the correct people to make as much of an impact on accessibility features as they possibly could. And I deeply respect them for that. And I, I had a blast working with them. I have told, I told them when we were done, I said, you know what, guys, we're not done. <laughs> like, if, if there is anything else that I can work with you guys on, I will, I will work with you guys on. And the thing is, now that that's happened, and really during the process, um, it was really, honestly, at, at Game Accessibility Conference in 2017, where I decided that doing this work, being this Game Accessibility Consultant, is what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Like, this is what I, this is what I want now. This is, this is where I'm at. And, um, you know, stuff has happened as a result of that decision. Um, I have focused very, very hard on doing this work. So I've ended up, I have, I, I have other contracts now. I have um, other people I'm working with. I have worked with Ubisoft um, in, in a workshopping environment and things like that. Um, some good things have happened uh, as well. Um, so Amy asked me to tell you this, this story. I told her at the beginning of the, uh, the you know, before, before you guys, before all the, uh, the, uh, the watchers, the viewers were here. Um, but, uh, Amy asked me to tell you this story. It, it's, it actually goes, I I'm seeing someone saying that, uh, knowing Naughty Dog cares so much about accessibility is great. And, you know, as a disabled gamer, yes. And this story I'm about to tell you is it is, it is about me. It is about me, but it is also about PlayStation. I think, I think you guys, I think you guys need to hear this and I hope, I hope you guys can take away from this, what it means. Okay. So on PS5 launch day, which just happened this past Thursday. Um, I woke up in the morning at 7.15 a.m. because FedEx had arrived. Uh, FedEx dropped off a box. And we brought that box in the house. We opened that box. And inside that box was a really, really fancy storage container. It's, uh, I believe it's a material called Perspex. At least that's what people seem to think on my Twitter is that it's, 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 that's what it is. So hopefully that's what it is. Um, so we pulled that out and we're like, this is amazing. So the thing is I had pre-ordered a PS5. I actually was, I actually got into the PS5 pre-order program. So I was sure that that's what I was receiving this, you know, in the morning. I thought I was just getting that pre-order, but we pulled this out and we're like, wait a minute, everyone gets a box like this. This is, incre this is incredible, this is impressive. But then we noticed some things. We noticed two things. Number one, we noticed there was a card secured into the latch of this box. And then once the card was removed, I was examining the box the way blind people examine things just by feeling it. And um, I noticed that there was braille etched in, into the top of the box. Braille, ladies and gentlemen. And I was like, wait a minute, does everyone get braille on the box when they order a PS5? Is that how this works? That's tremendous. That's tremendous. That's amazing. Congratulations, Sony, on a nice accessibility feature. And only then did I actually read the message. And what the message said was, this is probably not word for word because I, I will not promise that I have the whole thing memorized, but basically what the message said was, 
<gasps> Brandon Cole. That's right. My name was the first thing the message said. And then it goes on to say, play is about more than what we see. It is about what we touch, what we hear, and perhaps most of all, what we feel. Thank you for working so hard to teach us that. This is for you. Play has no limits. So ladies and gentlemen, that's when it hit me that uh, what had actually happened, and this is still, this still hits me. Like I still, I just got chills like again, because what, what had happened, what had happened was that PlayStation had gifted me and basically awarded me a PlayStation 5. There's that, that was, that's in the box was a PlayStation 5. Um, but uh, they had awarded me a PlayStation 5 along with this message to let me know a giant we see you you know letting me know that they are recognizing my contribution to the video game industry and to accessibility and to them in particular so it's it meant a lot it meant a heck of a lot Thank and that, that's and that's that's what i want to do like if, if making a huge, huge impact that's what i'm all about <laughs> yeah um, it, it yeah. makes a huge difference and i think you know the work that you did on the last of us too it meant that you know blind people went out and bought playstations and played a video game it did it sold consoles yeah yeah for the first time maybe since they were children or maybe the first time ever like i knew several people that did that and like i fucking love that game <laughs> like <laughs> i mean i would like watch you replay it and I've only played through it once because like emotionally it's a lot. It's uh, a lot. It is a lot. I, I acknowledge that. It's a lot. But, uh, yeah. And I think you both do really amazing work. And I guess sort of starting off a bit of a QA, and a bit of a chat. Um, I've got about 15 minutes or so for questions. Um, I would say that there's quite a lot of questions about, well, how do we, how do we do what you guys do? How do you do? How do we do what you guys do? And I, I can speak from my experiences. I literally just tweeted about, oh, I'm playing video games and sort of followed and found Brandon and found Stacey and followed other disabled gamers. And there is a huge community out there. And then, yeah, basically Ian finds you. He like hunts you down. He does though. He really he does. does. He really does. He hunts you down. And then he, for me, he invited me to GA Conf uh, in 2018. And I gave a talk there. I was like the penultimate talk of the day after like eight talks, and everyone was <laughs> like half asleep. <laughs> but then, like, yeah, it was amazing. Like I think I woke them all up. Um, and it, that I, you know, that is a really great opportunity. And I think, you know, luckily now there's some good virtual events happening. But seriously, like we can hook you up with Ian, and he's always looking for people to even fill out surveys or there's something called, a, and I'm sure both Brandon and Stacey can explain these more than, than I can, because although I have been offered them, and this is one thing to be aware of, and it sounds super cool. After I did that conference, I got a lot of offers from like Xbox to go to Sweden or whatever and test things. And I was like, I would love to, but you've given me less than a week's notice and I have a full-time job. Um, so it, it sometimes it can be quite demanding, like they want you to come and test a thing like right now. Um, so if you have that flexibility, great. Um, I, I don't always, but yeah, like they're all, they are looking for people to consult with. They look for people to workshop with, you know, this is something they are realizing that they can make money off. And when they realize that someone is going to go out and buy a console to buy a game, they suddenly, you know, it sells, accessibility sells, as Stacey put in the chat, and gaming or, you know, big game developers are really realising that. And they're also realising, perhaps, as some of us have complained about this week, but if they don't get it right, there's quite a vocal community out there that will tell them that they've not got it right, and that we feel excluded, and that's not okay. But when they do get it right, oh my God, exactly. We bend over backwards. We're going to buy every series. You know, we're going to really be loyalty. In. Uh, and I think they're sort of realizing that if they put the effort in, they're getting this huge community to like back them up. And when I gave my talk in at, at GA Conf, I 
you know, I said that for me, you know, growing up as a visually impaired person, there were so many things that I was excluded from, but it turned out that I could play some video games. I couldn't always play them very well, and sometimes it took me a very long time to play them. But, you know, in that world, I can run and I can jump and I can drive a car and I can, you know, be a ninja or an assassin or, you know, a giant monster. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I get to access this world that is often denied to me in real life. And I, th I think for disabled people, that's hugely meaningful. Um, because we feel that, you know, it gives us an opportunity to control something, to, to explore life that sometimes just isn't there for us. And so that's why I feel quite passionate about games, because I think there is such a lovely community out there. Um, and I am on the Chronically Badass team. Stay Heck somewhere. yeah. That. So, okay, now I've finished waffling and taken up a whole six minutes of the question time. What would be your advice about how to get into this, you know, how to consult, how to end up like you both have, with ga you know, gaming jobs and consulting projects and things. Stacey, what would your advice be? Um, mine would be to get involved with the community. I think uh, Twitter is a really good place for it. Um, follow us, get involved in the conversations, tweet about things. If you're having barriers with games, talk about it, make a YouTube video, make a Twitch channel, just just get involved and um, get involved in the conversation because we're here and we are loud and we're not going anywhere. Yeah, so that, we would be, that would be my biggest one. <laughs> what about you, Brandon? Well, um, most kind of similar, but the way that I got started uh, was a blog. Um, I, I was, uh, in fact, it was my fiance's fault. Uh, she, she told me way back in 2005, just listening to my ideas about accessibility, she said, you should blog. I'm like, I don't blog. That's not a thing I do. So, <laughs> but eventually she convinced me. I started blogging. And um, you know, that led to GDC, which led to everything else. But now, the way, I approach, uh, the way that I approach all this is kind of a similar thing as Stacy, where um, my idea is everything should feed into everything else. So like, I stream on Twitch, for instance. I stream on Twitch for... You know, I, I stream to entertain because you should you should attempt to be entertaining if you stream. I, I believe you know entertainment is not everything, but you know I, I like entertaining people myself. So part of what I do is is to entertain on Twitch. That said, I also stream on Twitch to educate. Um, I will stop playing a game if someone comes in and asks me how I'm playing the game, and I will tell them how. I will stop playing a game and answer questions about accessibility or you know whatever if if someone has a question, um, and. I also stream for the developers, and that's also why I archive my some of my work on YouTube, um, because I do have an audience now. Of now that I now that I have been seen because of my blog, because of my work, I have an audience of game developers as well. So start, part of it is now for them to show them, hey, here's what we can play, here's how we can play it, um, or here's what we can't play, here's the struggles we have. I stream games that I can't really play that well too because it also shows them what the struggles are and also shows other, shows other gamers that, that happen in on the stream what the struggles are for blind gamers as well. So everything feeds in everything else now. That's the, way I, that's the way I work this. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also important to create whatever, whatever content you feel comfortable doing. Um, yeah. I've, had, I've had people say, you know, do you want to write a feature for our blog or whatever? But I, I have a very mathsy brain. I'm not very good with words. Um, I'm much more comfortable um, writing a script and you know recording a video and editing it. And that's kind of where my my comfort zone is. So if there's you know if you write you write already, then you know start a blog, write about um, the things that you're struggling with and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I would say if you're already good at something, do that. And um, yeah, join us, join us and get involved in all the conversations. We would love yeah. to have you. I think Twitch, is, you know, it is a really good, although, you know, Brandon and I can complain about the fact that Twitch itself is not very accessible. Um, <laughs> Don't get me started on that, not today. <laughs> <laughs> but it is good, you know, if you can get into it, you know, it is good, like, come, come and watch disabled people play. And like Brandon, like Stacey, most of us will answer questions and be like, how have you found this game? And actually even like, you know, there's a couple of bigger streamers that I follow that, 
you know, once you get kind of known to the community and you explain that you're a disabled gamer, I've had some positive experiences just saying, oh, you know, would you mind bringing up the menu and does this game have accessibility features? And people are quite nice like that, you know, especially if you, you know, you're being a positive member of their community. Um, this is a really good recommendation. And I think that we should take this one forwards if it's not already been taken. Another Amy, because I have my like army of Amy's that come to the staying in now. Um, it sounds a bit odd, but I would love to know sort of approximate times before a level is finished or the quest or the next good save point. So I can figure out whether I feel well enough to play the level or wait another day so I can enjoy it and not make it feel rushed and half hearted. And I think I would like that too, because with my vision, because it varies and it can deteriorate. If I knew, oh, I, you know, I can do this next bit in half an hour ish. I guess everyone plays in a different way. But yeah, that kind of spoon use, you know, how long roughly until the next bit? Would you think that would be an achievable kind of progress bar that we could build in? What do you think, Brandon? Actually, um, <laughs> I have really good news. Oh yeah? The PlayStation, the PlayStation 5 literally does this. Oh, whoa, the, what? Uh, the, the activity so feature cool. of the PlayStation 5 there's a new feature in PS5 called activities. Uh, you can click on a game and go down to its activities row. And in the activities row, it'll show you in, uh, in PS5 games that support this, it'll show you the missions that are available to you. So you can actually, number one, you can click on a mission to go straight to it instead of having to, like it'll, even if the game is closed, it'll load the game into the mission you click on. So you're only doing the thing you wanna do. Number two, it'll show you the estimated time of completion for that thing you wanna, that, that particular activity just mission by mission, showing the estimated time it will take you to complete it. Wow. So that actually is a current feature. <laughs> wow. I love that. I love okay. that. That's, yeah, that, I think that's just really helpful for everyone, right? Like, yeah. even yeah. if you don't have any, you know, accessibility needs, if you, you know, your bedtime's in half an hour or, you know, you've got to get ready for work, um, <laughs> that's really useful, I think. That's so cool. Okay. Um, this is a good question from Sam. And I think we can all answer this. Have we ever had any luck getting accessibility features patched into a pre-existing game? Obviously not ideal to building a game to be inclusive from the ground up, but I'm curious if this is something developers are open to. I'm gonna say yes, the example that I can think of, although it was too jeffing late for me, was they increased the text size in Ghost of Tsushima. Um, it was quite a late update, but they did respond to calls to increase the text size. It's still not that big, but you know, something. What about you, Stacey? You got a good example? Yes, my favourite one was um, uh, Marvel's Avengers, which was a Square Enix game that came out a couple months ago. Um, I was playing in the beta and I actually couldn't, I had to stop playing it for motion sickness because they had this really intense screen shake. Um, it was literally any time your character threw a punch, the screen would wobble and I felt so ill playing it. And about two weeks later, they patched it in so that you could just turn it on or off. Easy peasy. Um, so that was really awesome. Obviously it's not, yeah, it's it's not ideal doing it after release and patching things in. It's it's a lot easier if you think about accessibility right at the beginning of the process rather than somewhere near the end. But it's definitely something that we're seeing a lot more of recently. Um, I think the the Outer Worlds also um, introduced scalable text. So it wasn't just the subtitles, it was the entire UI. So all of the text on screen, they, they patched that in in a later update as well. So that was really cool. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something we're starting to see a lot more of, definitely. What about you, Brandon? What, if, what, what examples do you have? Yeah, um, the best example I have, I, actually, I was not going to reference the Outer Worlds as well, but <laughs> another example that I have is uh, Madden 19, the, the sports game Madden NFL 19. When, um, when Karen Stevens, who is now the EA Accessibility Lead, started working on Madden 19, she got them to patch in some additional force feedback cues, some additional vibration cues to help blind players uh, know certain things about the game while they played it. So blind players would then know when a ball was thrown, uh, what type of play was being run, whether it was a pass or a run, that kind of thing. Just kind of uh, just some helpful uh, vibration cues. No audio cues back then, but some helpful vibration cues. Um, that said, it is much more difficult to patch in accessibility later than it is to build it from the ground up, like Stacy said. Um, 
but I do want to speak to a comment that I just uh, just heard in chat as well. Someone was saying that uh, remakes of games are not are, are tending to not have the features that we've come to expect. Um, I just want to point out my, uh, Marvel Spider-Man Remastered, which comes with the Ultimate Edition of Miles Morales, has every single accessibility feature that Miles Morales has. Every single one. So they they remade the game from 2018, but added every accessibility feature that the new 2020 Spider-Man game has. So it's just worth mentioning. It's a good example of things are happening. <laughs> that would, I mean, I have to say Spider-Man, especially with even more, I mean, I found it pretty cracking, to be honest. Um, and I used examples of it. And I think the way they use audio cues, like it was the first time I'd really experienced like a good solid audio cue in a game. Um, and that I would recommend that I think as a pan disability game, I think Spider-Man does pretty well. I mean, obviously I don't have other experiences of playing it, but you know, from what the community has, has said, um, as we are, you know, we don't wanna, as much as beautiful Gary and beautiful Monia and very lovely Sam are supporting us today, we don't wanna take the piss and take up too much extra of their time. Um, uh, does anyone else have any further questions? I'm also going to pause for a moment if anyone would like to ask an audio question to unmute yourself or indeed contact Gary or Monia to ask a BSL question. So I'm just going Hi to guys. Hey Ian. I have a question. So I played a lot of games until 15 months ago when I lost my vision. Um, I was always a PlayStation gamer. I now have no useful vision and I guess I've been slightly worried about buying a console and kind of how many games are really going to be an option for me to play. So wondered what your thoughts were. I'm going to pass this. I got this. Yeah. Got <laughs> I got this. <laughs> first of all, um, greetings to you. First of all, second of all, um, if this is the best generation to buy a game console, if you're blind, 100%. Um, the video that Amy was trying to show in the beginning, you should totally go watch that because that, that is a uh, that is a demonstration of the PS5's screen reader, which is actually they called it a screen reader this time because it's it fills the entire console. It is actually it works throughout the whole system. Uh, as for games you can play, I of course recommend The Last of Us Two because I worked on it. But there are other games you can play. It really depends on what you're into in terms of like style and genre and things like that. Um, but I could probably recommend something for most genres. Um, for instance, there's a really great game that I, I don't want you to underestimate. It's, so the thing, about, the thing about other games is that we're still moving into the area where games are not still, not most games are not designed uh, with the blind in mind. That said, there are, there's a thing I call accidental accessibility. Wow. And many games um, fit that accidental accessibility description. There's an amazing game called 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim. It is a game, uh, it is a combination of a visual novel and a, um, basically a, a mech combat game. Giant robots, giant monsters, and very anime-like characters. But that said, it's an amazing game. The voice acting is high quality. Um, it's, it's actually basically fully accessible because it happens to have audio cues, not because of blind people, just because they put certain audio notifications in that just work for us in positive ways. So, you know, I, I could go on for hours about this, but if you, if you want, uh, if you'd like, I, I definitely uh, encourage you to, to message me on Twitter. I will do my best to help you out. That's kind of a starting baseline. Definitely Last of Us 2. Uh, 13 Sentinels is a great pick if you're a PlayStation gamer. By the way, that is PS4 exclusive. 13 Sentinels is as well. Um, the Mortal Kombat games, if you like fighting games, you know, I'm, I'm a... I'm a big Mortal Kombat guy, so that's I, that's one of my recommendations all the time. Um, yeah, and there's there's other stuff out there. It's a good time to also, be a gamer. <laughs> I would also say that Brandon and there's another chap who's um, I believe UK based called Sightless Combat. Yes, they are, yes. They are like tech geniuses, and they will find every hack for you to get around games. And they, you guys, try to play every single game. <laughs> yes, we do. And, yes, um, we do. <laughs> You know, you find a way, you find a way. Um, okay, a couple of other questions. If you could, this is from Slow Silver. If you could play any game and magically plug in the full accessibility that you needed, what would it be? For me, uh, I would like to see, I played it, but I played it on story mode. 
and I genuinely couldn't like get the most out of the game, I would have really loved God of War to have been more accessible. That would have been my 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 pick. What's yours, Stacey? Mine would be the Doom games. Like I aesthetically love them. I'm a massive goth, and the thought of just being able to chainsaw demons in the face is just, <laughs> it's my perfect yeah, game. I love it. I love it. Um, but I just could not play it. I literally played, I would be able to play it for maybe half an hour and then I would have a migraine and have to lay down in the dark for about four hours afterwards. And that's not an exaggeration. Um, those games just made me so incredibly ill. So if I could just magically fix all of the camera issues that I have with that game and uh, be able to play those games, Doom and Doom Eternal, I would absolutely play the hell out of those, pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely intended um i would i what i want is a fully accessible full-scale rpg experience because right now we just mm. don't have one as totally blind players mm. i want to play a witcher 3 i want to play a dragon age something of that nature um because i never have uh because it's just not an option right now so yeah if, if i could make any game accessible probably something like the witcher 3 so i can lose myself for apparently something like 200 hours yeah. in that crazy crazy game <laughs> yeah witcher 3 god so many hours so many hours i should replay it because i fucking love that game yeah but it's shit that rpg is not accessible it really is yeah. um <laughs> this is a random question uh this is two it's a slightly random question uh, i'm gonna go with this first because it just made me laugh and I'm not quite sure if you'll know this. This is from Holly. Is Cuphead ableist like the internet said? No idea. Stacey? No idea at all. Uh, I haven't played it. I know my husband's played it a lot. Um, it just looked like the kind of game that I would just get very angry at and stop playing immediately. It's meant <laughs> to be very difficult. It's meant to be yeah, incredibly difficult. Yeah, it's meant difficult. to be very, very difficult. Yeah. Um, no, I don't know, don't know very much about it. This is a, this is a good question from Sam. Short of spending power, what can we do to encourage games companies to invest in accessibility and take it seriously? Do you want to take that one first, Brandon? Yeah, I think the best thing to do is to talk to them. Like just, and most importantly, when you do talk to them, try not, absolutely let them know what your grievances are, but try not to do it in a, like a, a trollish or negative way. Just well, let them know. Don't be a dick. Right, right. These are the problems with this game. This is why I can't play it. Uh, you know, would you be willing to think about accessibility in the future? What you really want to do through the course of talking to developers, and this is something that took, I, I will admit this, it took me a while to learn this, is you want to find out who your champions are. Mm -hmm. um, there's usually one at every game developer who's like, you know, you're right. Accessibility would be a great idea. Use that, make that person your champion for that company. Or that game developer and push all your ideas and all your thoughts about accessibility through that person let them deal with everyone else at, at the development team let them champion for you at that game development company if you can find that champion um that's that's my recommendation for that yeah i agree i also think that you made a really good point about how to kind of speak about these things especially yes. you know if you're tagging someone on twitter and you you know I, I've, I get upset about barriers that I have in games, but I think you also need to bear in mind that game developers, are, are, they're just people too, and a lot of them really are trying their best. Um, so I think one, keep in mind that you might they might not necessarily be excluding you on purpose. There might just be something that they didn't think about. Um, and also be mindful that things may be a lot more complicated um, to fix um, and might be quite quite complex in the background to fix and might not be as straightforward as you think. Um, so yeah, just be nice, be calm and um, yeah, just try to build those relationships um, because it, it, it can make an impact. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I could, if I didn't have brain fog at nine o'clock at night, I could think of some good examples, but there are definitely things that people have, you know, raised with people with uh, with studios and with game developers on, you know, on Twitter in the last in the last six months to a year that we've seen changes um, brought in for things patched and stuff like that. So, well, um, you literally, like, you know, Ubisoft literally just put out a statement mm -hmm. saying, yeah. "We've heard you, accessibility community. We have heard you." Well, also, I, I do want to say something on the heels of that, though. 
um, mostly on the heels of uh, the whole building the relationship idea. Um, and that is that you definitely do want to make sure you build those relationships and also you have to keep an op open mind. Mm -hmm. So when you suggest an accessibility feature, when you go to the, the game developer and, and air your grievances, as you should, you absolutely should air your grievances with the game developer, find your champion, all that stuff. When you do that though, you have to understand and keep an open mind about the fact that what may happen is the accessibility feature you want may not be patched into that game. But maybe, maybe what you've actually done is put the bug in their ear. Maybe you found your champion and maybe that accessibility feature shows up next time around in their next game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I am going to go to Ira, who has their hand raised. Ira, unmute yourself and uh, feel free to ask your question. Um, yeah, I was wondering about um, like audibility settings in games and if anyone knows anything about like people who are consulting on that because as someone who has hyperacusis and needs certain like dynamic ranges to be smaller, I have a hard time finding games that work. So I play a lot of first person shooters and I can't hear footsteps because the bullets are going to be too loud if I have like yeah. my volume up and so like people complain to me because like I can't hear it. Um, and so do you think in the future there's going to be more um, accessibility regarding volume? And one, I just like to make one other comment is that in Last of Us 2, there is a very dynamic range, a very narrow dynamic range setting. Um, but I didn't know this because it's called Midnight. And so I looked at it and I went, that doesn't have anything to do with sound. And it turns out I had to play the whole game on mute because I didn't realize that was a setting. Um, and I don't even think that was really even narrow enough for me necessarily. Um, and so I just feel like that kind of disability isn't really on the map at all regarding video games. Well, um, I'll take this one first because I'm happy to disagree with you on that. Um, <laughs> it is on the roadmap. Uh, I say it's on the roadmap because when I consult on accessibility, when, when I work on a project, including The Last of Us 2, I actually do bring up um, the idea of volume options and that there should be volume options for every single aspect of the game. Um, Last of Us 2 has quite a few volume options for different aspects, but yeah, you're right. It could absolutely have been better. Um, I will fully acknowledge that. But that said, it is something that I personally bring up as a consultant. So there, I, I, you, ha you already have one person in your corner. I promise you that. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think we're definitely starting to see more games having sort of independent volume sliders so that you can yeah. try and adjust it. Um, but yeah, there's there's no perfect game. Um, yeah, I get asked that all the time. Starting, yeah, it. it's it's starting to happen. I think so. Um, you know, hopefully the next the next bunch of games that come out will will be a bit more accessible for you. Hopefully. Yeah, and as both Ira and Marie make the point, they need to have a proper label. Like, tell us what it is, you know? <laughs> Midnight. What yeah, earth? I agree with that. I agree with that. I completely agree with that. Um, yeah. Uh, Alex asks, Brandon, what was your favorite highlight working on The Last of Us 2? Alex oh, is a low vision player who has very much enjoyed The Last of Us 2. My favorite highlight? You know what comes to mind? Like, so I've always felt really welcome every time I went to the Naughty Dog studio and well, okay. There's a, the thing is, there's so much, there's so many good things that happened during that that process. But I guess if I had to, I'm going to give you two. One is actually related to the work, and one is not. <laughs> so, the one that's related to the work is during testing. Uh, when I was there, in, I believe it was in 2018 when they when they invited me back out there. We were testing the accessibility features for the first time. We had our game plan. We knew what we wanted to implement. We were testing the features out. During testing, I got my first ever stealth kill in any video game, you know, you know, because of these accessibility features that we were adding to this game. And uh, that will always be a highlight of mine. In fact, it was a highlight to them too. They showed my first stealth kill ever in the GA Conf 2020 presentation that they did this past year. So, <laughs> so I guess it was a highlight for them too. The one that is not work related, but was still a highlight from the last of us experience is one time we were uh, devouring some lunch and the lunch was amazing. And then they brought in this very large amount of giant plate sized chocolate chip cookies. that were like the warmest, gooeyest chocolate chip cookies you can possibly imagine. 
the size of plates. And it was amazing. And everyone, I'm, I, I'm not even kidding, everyone who worked on the game that day still talks about those. <laughs> <laughs> everyone does. Video game perks. That's yeah. Right. That's right. It's, yeah. it's, good to be, it's good to be a consultant, ladies and gentlemen. You get plate-sized cookies. Yeah, this is the perk. Plate-sized cookies. I love it. Okay, well, I'm going to um, wrap up for today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put out a couple of recommendations. I'm putting a link in the chat, and I will link this on <laughs> Twitter. I like what Amy said in the chat. Yeah. I'm not, Imagine I'm being the unlucky not, soul who was off that day. I can't, I can't link to the cookies, I'm afraid. Oh, no, um, if, only, if only we could. <laughs> um, I'm going to link to caniplaythat.com, which is a great review website. JC features on it fairly regularly. Um, uh, Absolutely. And I, it's great for kind of getting accessibility reviews of games. They do it from all different kind of perspectives. I'm also going to link to Special Effect. It is a charity and like, oh, we can have feelings about the name, but what they are great at is advice. And they're really good at giving you advice around say, adaptive controllers, or they can support you set up equipment. You can, I think under normal circumstances, you can go and test equipment with them and see what, find, what works for you. Um, so they're a really great organization for that. I'm then gonna spam the chat with the Twitch accounts of first of all here is Brandon watch him play games here is Stacy Stacy's fancy she's a partner she's like properly fancy <laughs> Stacy I want to be a partner too I'll yeah we all want to be I'll partners yeah I got a partner like uh like five years ago it was a lot easier back then there are a lot fewer of us <laughs> Um, so and I've also put myself in there because I play video games and you can come and watch me play video games and my Twitch name is great. Uh, I'm the blind button masher and I love it. I'm great. Um, I'm <laughs> oh, thank you. So, so, apparently I can, I, can, I can personally attest to the blind and the button mashing. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and Stacey like helped me. Like I literally, I had to have a call with Stacey and I was like, how do I do the technology? Explain to me how I make it work. We made it work. Yeah. We did it. No, I literally cannot throw grenades for Toffee. You are right. You are right. <laughs> grenades go very badly wrong. Oh, yeah. And also me playing Fall Guys is, um, yeah, a lot. I've never won a <laughs> Um, I Yeah, so, and Twitch is really fun. And you discover more people through Twitch. Like, you can check out the Chronically Badass team. They're very nice. Um, so I'm going to bring us to a close, and as usual, I'm going to thank our beautiful interpreters, Gary, Monia, and also we're going to thank our live captions person, Sam. We're going to do a big British Sign Language thank you, which is where we put our palms with our fingertips and our chin, and then we flow them out beautifully. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We're, of course, going to do an enormous thank you to Stacey and Brandon, and I'm just going to ask because I haven't taken a screenshot yet. What I'm going to ask today is, uh, as I'm going to ask for everyone that has their camera on, to do a little happy face, to do a little cheer, to hold up their booze, you know, to look excited. Hold up a game controller if you've got it. That's mine, it's here somewhere. And then say we chatted about gaming. Ah, right, I'm going to put that there, because I have to use all three fingers. <laughs> I love it, all the gamers with their controllers. I love it. Oh, <laughs> even Gary's got the controllers. Interpreter Gary's all over it. <laughs> Great work. Well, this was um, a really fun session. We will carry on the chat on Twitter, including tomorrow, you know, if people have, you know, have drained a lot of your energy, I'm aware. Um, but yeah, we can we can you know keep linking you to those resources. What I'll probably do is I'll start tagging a bunch of really great disabled gamers to follow, and I'm sure Stacey and Brandon will have their recommendations as well. So thank you so much for joining us today. Please do come and watch us play video games, even if it's not something you would normally do. All of us have auto caps, I believe. Brandon, you've got auto caps now, haven't you? Yeah, I do. I do have captions now. Yep. Yeah, and Stacey has them, and I have them. And both Brandon and I tend to describe quite a lot what we're doing, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Do. 
It's part of the job. Part of the job. <laughs> so yeah, we're you know when you, it, I really like streaming. It's kind of like it's a bit has a bit of the staying in vibes. You know, you have chats, you meet people. It's good fun. It does, but, yeah. Yeah, and you know, there's usually very few assholes. So so far, from, in my experience. Yeah, they're they're few and far between. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, guys. Thank you for this great session. Brandon and Stacey, send your invoices. Interpreters, send your invoices. And uh, have a lovely evening. And it was great. Having us. All right. Thank you very much. Bye, guys. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. <laughs>